Hey guys, this particular video is going to be dedicated to proving a very useful formula. And that useful formula is the sum, the sum of torques acting on a body is going to be equal to the moment of inertia of that body times by the angular acceleration of that body. Um, okay, so th this formula is useful for dynamics and statics, but in order to prove it from scratch, we need to go over a few terms. We need to do a little bit of revision. So let's start with that. We know that, that if this is our axis, x and y, and if we have a particle which is traveling in a circular path, let me reiterate that, it's traveling in a circular path, then its radius will be constant right and we'll have a magnitude of r we also know that it, the velocity of our particle will be tangential to our circular path and we'll have a magnitude of v but if we introduce this new term called momentum and we call it mv then we know that its momentum will be parallel to our velocity and we'll just have a slightly different magnitude right that's because we're timesing it by our scalar n right and we'll have a magnitude of mv Okay, so so that's our, that's that's this mv term denotes our linear momentum, right? And it's just going to be parallel to our velocity, right? We just we just know that it's just going to be along the tangential path of our circle, right? So that's fairly straightforward. Let's see if we can now introduce an even newer term. Let's define let's define angular momentum. Angular momentum. angular momentum as L of our particle. So basically we're defining the angular momentum of our particle as R times by our linear momentum. We're defining it this way, okay? All right, well, let's see. Out of pure interest, let's say we wanted to differentiate our angular momentum of our particle with respect to time. Let's say we wanted to differentiate this. What do we get? Well, we know that it's just going to be d dt of Rp. Right, we know that much. But what's that? Well, we know that because our radius is constant, because it's traveling around in a circle, we can write that as r times d dt, d dt of our momentum p. Right? Okay. Well, what's what's the derivative of our momentum? Well, we know that momentum is just mv. Right? So let's just write that in. It's going to be mv. And under the assumption that the mass of our particle doesn't change, so remember, this is our mass of our particle just here. Under the assumption that the mass of our particle doesn't change, in other words, it's constant, that means we can factorize that out, meaning that we're left with rn times d dt, d dt of v, right? Okay, well, that's fairly straightforward. But this should be setting off alarm bells now, because we can write that as rm dv dt, and we know that dv dt is just the acceleration of our particle, right? So we can write that as rma, okay? And this should be setting off more alarm bells because we know that if, if m is the mass of our particle and a is the acceleration of our particle, then we can use this formula, which I'm sure we're aware of, the sum of forces is equal to ma, right? To write that as our d dt of our angular momentum, of our particle is going to be equal to rf. This is huge. This is huge because because if we were to define define torque define torque as tau is equal to rf where r is perpendicular to your force, right? And that has that's really crucial. r is perpendicular to your force. Then we can write this as tau just here. So that means we can have this this little um, equal sign um, showing you how tau is equal to rf and that's equal to your derivative of your angular momentum, right? Notice that r must be perpendicular to f because a is perpendicular to r, right? Here's your, here's your radius, it's perpendicular to v, right? Which means that it's also perpendicular to a, which means it's also perpendicular to f. Okay, so so basically this is crucial here. It means that R must be perpendicular to your force, right? Okay, now that's your little bit of revision covered. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to consider a system of rotating objects. So let's say that we've got an axis of rotation right here. This is our axis of rotation. I'm just going to put a cross through it, right? And let's say we've got a bunch of masses, discrete masses, discrete masses 
just rotating around this object, uh, rotating around this axis of rotation, right? So th this this will be an object of mass m1, this will be an object of mass m2, this will be an object of mass m3, I think you get the idea, right? And let's say we wanted to find out, let's say we wanted to find out what is our total angular momentum of our system? What is our total angular momentum of our system of objects rotating around our axis of rotation, right? What is that? Well, in order to do that, all we need to notice is that we can sum up the angular momentum of each of these objects. So let's, let's take M1 first. This will be, this will be our radius, this will be our radius of rotation, right? And this will be our momentum, it will be perpendicular. It'll be P, right? Likewise, this is our second mass. This is our second mass. It'll have a radius R2, and this will be our momentum P2. I should really write P subscript 1 there, right? Same with M3. This will be our radius R3, and this will be our momentum P3, right? Okay, well, if we wanted to figure out the total angular momentum, we know that's just going to be equal to L1 plus L2 plus L3 plus, well, it'll be all the way to Ln if there's n objects in this system rotating, right? So, what we can do now is we can just calculate each of these terms individually, right? It seems like a laborious task, but it's actually quite simple. Let's first calculate L1. Well, we know L1, our angular momentum of our first mass, is just going to be equal to, what will it be? It'll be R1 times by P1, right? Well, what's P1? That's just going to be R1 times M1V1, right? So far, this doesn't seem to be helping, but, but we know from our circular motion videos that we can write this as R1 M1 times by, and we just substitute V1 as R1 omega. Here's the trick, okay? Notice that omega doesn't have a subscript 1 next to it. That's because this entire system of objects rotating shares the same angular velocity, right? It shares the same angular velocity. So consequently, we can write this as we can write this as r1 squared m1 times by omega, right? And this is crucial because we can write the same thing for L3, L2, L4, L5, L6, all the way to Ln. So let me just do a few. This will be L2. We can do the exact same process and be left with R2 squared M2 times omega. We can do the same for L3. And that's just going to be R3 squared M3 omega. And we can do the same for L4. That's going to be R4 squared M4 times omega. Oh, let me just pause quickly. Hey guys, sorry about that. Someone was at my door. Anyway, so where was I? So we've got our angular momentums L1, L2, L3, L4, all the way to Ln. And if we, su and if we sum them all up, then we'll get our total angular momentum. So let's do that. Let's do that. And let me just write it down here. This is going to be L total that's going to be L1 plus L2 plus L3 plus L4 plus dot 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 plus Ln, where there are n objects in our system, right? And we know that L1, as, as you'll recall just above, is just R1 squared M1 omega, and L2 is just going to be R2 squared M2 omega, and R3, sorry, L3 is just going to be R3 squared m3 omega, and we're going to be adding that dot 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 onwards to ln, which is just going to be rn squared mn omega. Okay, this may seem very convoluted, right, because there's a lot of terms in here and it doesn't seem a way to simplify it, but rest assured there is. We can, because omega is the same for all of these, we can factorize it out, and we can be left with omega times by r1 squared m1 plus r2 squared m2 plus r3 squared m3 plus all the way to rn squared mn, right? And this is really interesting now because we can use this right now and make a summation sign. We can say that that's the same thing as the sum, the sum of ri squared mi 
from i is equal to 1 to i is equal to n, right? That's the same thing. This is just a mathematical equiv equivalency, right? So we can write this now as that's equal to omega times by the sum, the sum of n i is equal to 1 of r i squared m i, right? But we also know from a previous video that this is also equal to our moment of inertia. I derived that in a previous video for discrete masses, and so we'll, I won't prove that in this video, but we can write that as omega times by i, right? This is huge because we now know that our total, our total angular momentum is going to be L1 plus L2 plus L3 plus L4 plus dot 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 plus Ln is going to be equal to omega i. This is massive, right? Because we're one step away from our final goal. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to differentiate um, all of these and we'll be left with the derivative of our total angular momentum is going to be equal to, well, it will be the derivative of each of these terms, because the derivative sign is, is, has the distributive, distributive property. So it will be ddt of L1 plus ddt of L2 plus ddt of L3 plus, I think you get the idea, plus ddt of L, Ln. And that's going to be equal to ddt of Wi. Okay, we're almost done here because we know that i is just a function of your radius and your mass, both of which aren't influenced by time. So we know that i can be brought outside of this differential sign and we're left with i times d dt of omega, which we know is i alpha, right? So that's, that's, that's the right-hand side sorted, right? What about this left-hand side? Well, we know that d dt of L1, remember L1 is just a particle, is just going to be equal to Rf, right? So it's going to be R times by F1. Oops, hold on. Sorry guys, the door went off again. Okay, so that's going to be d dt of L1 is going to be R1 F1. We proved that earlier when we were doing a little bit of revision. And d dt of L2 is just going to be R2 F2, right? And dd, ddt of L3 is going to be R3 F3, and I think you get the idea. And that's going to go all the way to, all the way to to Rn Fn, right? And the beauty of this is, is we can use our definition of torques to give us this final expression, which is torque one plus torque two plus torque three plus dot 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 plus torque n is going to be equal to i alpha and you've probably guessed it by now that the sum the sum of torques around any rotating point is or any rotating axis is going to be equal to your moments of inertia around that same rotating axis times by your angular acceleration that is your proof right this shows it right albeit this proof is a little bit substandard considering it doesn't cover the formal way like it doesn't involve linear algebra but it's still perfectly valid um, because it, it because of the way I've just shown it <laughs> okay um, all right so um, a few interesting things to notice about this formula first of all for statics um, when we're concerned with things which don't have angular acceleration for example a truss like this for something which doesn't have an angular acceleration, that means you'll that means our angular acceleration will be equal to zero, which means the sum of torques, the sum of torques around any point must be equal to zero. That's a formal proof for why we do that formula in statics. Okay, um, so this will play a huge part in a lot of different um, problems we're going to be doing in the future, but I just hope you um, understand the way it was derived. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it.